right, so uh, good to be here, and I will try to keep you awake if not like mildly entertained. So I have no financial disclosures, um, and I do acknowledge that I've ripped off about just every available slide set out there on allergic rhinitis and sinusitis. There's not one slide in here <laughs> that is <laughs> of my doing, almost, maybe, maybe it was one or two. But uh, you know, the, the good news is that there's plenty of stuff out there, and it was actually fairly easy to synthesize this. It did take a little time. But mostly the World Allergy Organization contributed a lot of slides. Mark Dykowitz, who's at Wake Forest, I used some of his stuff. Very nice guy, so I, I know he doesn't mind. All right, so let's talk about some definition of, uh, of rhinase and allergic rhinase. And so this is stuff that you should be familiar with already you know, for most of you folks. And by the way, just before I get much further, show of hands, uh, sub eyes, PGY1s, PGY2s, PGY3s, okay, and am I missing anybody? Yeah, well, <laughs> thanks, Jerry. <laughs> All right, so good to know who's in the crowd. All right, so rhinitis, um, it's, as, you can, uh, as, as we're all familiar with, you know, the, the general symptoms include uh, nasal discharge, sneezing, airway obstruction, itchiness in terms of the hallmark signs, the uh, physical findings. And allergic rhinitis, you know, basically means that it's, it's an IgE-mediated uh, mechanism with inflammation, uh, airway hyperreactivity some ways, uh, and also mucosal thickening and remodeling. We're all familiar, we are all have heard about allergic rhinitis, but also there's various other forms as well too that are very common that we see in our ambulatory practice. That includes infectious uh, rhinitis that happens quite often, especially this time of the year with say the kids coming back to school or, or college kids coming back to school uh, and, and infecting each other. Non-allergic, non-infectious rhinitis, which is one of the most common diagnoses that we make in the allergy space when people send patients to us and we find out that there's not a relevant allergen. Uh, NARES, which is kind of like non-allergic rhinitis, it does have eosinophilias, but they are not, but they have no uh, evidence of atopy otherwise. And then chronic rhinosinusitis, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. There are also some very minor, you know, rare things, things like I call lifestyle rhinitis, where you can have rhinitis to foods, sex, drugs, alcohol, that type of stuff. So, you know, that's a little less common, but you hear about it. All right, so. The prevalence of rhinitis in the United States is about 30%. About a third of that is seasonal. Let me see if I can get my uh, mouse to go here. Oh yeah, there you go, very cool. So third of, it, third of it's seasonal, about two thirds of it is uh, perennial. And you can see that um, overall, if you averaged it, about 60, 60, 65% of them will have positive skin tests. Uh, and you're gonna have more of that if they come in with a history of seasonal versus, say, history of perennial. Uh, why do we care about allergic rhinitis? You may think, well, this is just a really minor disorder, you know, who cares, right? Uh, turns out, well, you know, we, we do care because it's so common, it can impair quality of life, it can lead to issues in terms of work and school absence, impaired learning, sleep, and also has lots of comorbidities, so it can be sometimes the canary in the coal mine. So. I want to ask you guys a question. Um, given a list of conditions including asthma, respiratory infections, stress, and migraine, where would allergic rhinitis rank in terms of mean productivity loss employee per year? So this is kind of a you know um, you know loss to society. So think about it, and I'm going to start it right now, and I'm going to give you guys uh, 10 seconds to register. So I see eight, nine, 10. Let's see how many of you guys are out there. It looks like about a dozen and a half of you guys, so some of you guys may still be thinking. Go ahead and just guess if you can't come up with anything. All right, looks like we're not going to get any more. I'll stop it. Get rid of this little pop-up. Display the ac accident, um, the, um, the results. And we have a spread. It looks like uh, you guys are voting for second. Um, and, but we have a spread across the uh, 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 continuum here. So actually turns out to be number one. So in a study that was done about six, six years ago, it's kind of like a socioeconomic policy study, uh, they found allergic rhinitis you know, uh, you know, had uh, a mean loss of productivity of about $600 uh, dollars per employee per year. And you can see that it towers literally among some of the other common disorders that we uh, commonly think of when patients come in and say, you know, I can't go to work today, such as, say, an upper respiratory infection, maybe an asthma exacerbation, anxiety, even migraine headaches. So quite impressive. 
Um, we know that uh, allergic rhinitis also impacts uh, quality of life. So if you look at this, you can see that, you know, oops, let me see if I can back up here. Uh, you can see that um, it impacts physical functioning. So the light blue, the light blue bar is controls. Allergic rhinitis is the uh, orange bar. Lower the score, you know, worse the healthcare status, and so you get lower physical functioning, uh, physical ability, body pain, general health, vitality, uh, and mental health. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there are comorbidities that are associated with allergic rhinitis, and we'll talk about a few right here. Mostly, uh, we'll talk about chronic rhinal sinusitis and acute rhinal sinusitis uh, in a little bit. But obviously, but the other thing that we want to think about is that when we think about allergic rhinitis, we also have to keep in mind the possibility of asthma, especially in this region of the country. So overall, uh, if you have allergic, if you have uh, asthma, 85% of you will also have allergic rhinitis. If you have allergic rhinitis, approximately 50% of you will also have concomitant asthma. So that's basically the takeaway point of this uh, diagram right here. All right, and this was a study that was done at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island by Cetipane. This is a classic study where he enrolled all the incoming freshmen, assessed them for allergic rhinitis by skin testing and symptoms, and followed them out over 23 years and found that they had a three-fold increased risk of new onset asthma if at baseline they had allergic rhinitis coming in versus non-allergic rhinitis. So again, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but you know, always keep asthma in mind. Look for the signs, look for the symptoms, and you know, pursue the diagnosis if necessary, especially in your younger patients. Now, we all know that allergic rhinitis is tied to a number of very common allergens that we see around here. Obviously, house, uh, um, house dust mite, uh, you know, grass trees, like uh, birch tree, bet V1, oak tree, maple trees, uh, wheat, uh, ragweed pollen, short ragweed is starting to spike already. We also have moderate amounts of mold uh, in the environment, like uh, um, Cladosporium, Asper, uh, um, uh, Aspergillus uh, altenarium, uh, which is associated with both rhinitis and also asthma. Uh, pets, dogs, cats, cockroach, Blodgy one German cockroach, indoors, uh, and we've just talked about molds uh, already. So what happens when you have an allergen uh, you know, exposure and uh, in the nasal passage and how does it work? So you may be familiar with this already, but it's worth going through again. You have cross-linking the allergen uh, 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 with IgE, cross-linking the IgE on a mast cell, release a number of mediators, preformed mediators like histamine, prostaglandins, prostacyclins, uh, you know, leukotrienes, and so forth, and it sets off an immediate early response, which we you know, classically see was within minutes, 15, 20 minutes, sneezing, uh, itchy nose, runny nose, uh, um, uh, nasal obstruction, and uh, conjunctivitis. But then it also causes endothelial cell activation and leukocyte he uh, chemotaxis uh, and infiltration with eosinophils, basophils, uh, T cells, if I can get this thing going here. And then you get a late phase response that occurs six to 12 hours later where you get more nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, and then you get this nasal hyper response, which is kind of what we, uh, we, we often call priming. So you, once you are already primed, it doesn't take that much to set you off to, get, to have even further symptoms. And as well as higher sensitivity to non-allergic uh, irritants like uh, tobacco smoke, barometric pressure changes, and so forth. All right, so in terms of the history, what are you looking for, okay? So you're typically gonna be asking about things like, you know, nasal symptoms like rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, sneezing, itchiness, which, you know, kind of helps you lead you down the path of whether this is, say, non-allergic versus allergic. So itchiness is, um, is uh, more common with allergic rhinitis. Also, itchy, watery, red, swollen eyes tend to be more common with allergic rhinitis um, and more common with uh, pollen allergies as versus uh, to dust mite allergies where you may have more rhinitis nasal symptoms. You want to talk about, you want to think about the season, okay? So is this early spring, late spring, summer, fall? If it's early spring trees, late spring grasses, uh, you might, we, get, we tend to get a break in the summer when the, uh, when the grass pollens drop and before the ragweed starts in about the second week of August. And then August to the first frost, 
we have ragweed. So what is the pattern? Year round, well maybe they have something indoors like molds, pets, dust mites and so forth. Environment, you know, what's going on at work or, you know, do their, does their workplace have uh, problems with mold and so forth so they may have perennial symptoms, you know, they, maybe they work in a basement someplace and they notice that when they go away on vacation their symptoms get better. Um, whether they're indoors and outdoors, again, so, you know, outdoor pollens, outdoor molds, for example, and again, specific triggers that may be very, uh, that, uh, uh, that may be, um, that they may have in their environment, so they may have an indoor dog, indoor cat, or when they visit a family member that have dogs and cats. Uh, we talked about molds in buildings, but also mold when you cut the grass. So, you know, we often commonly think of pollen allergy or grass allergy when anybody cuts the mold, but you're also disturbing the dirt and so forth, and you're throwing up a lot of mold as well too, especially in the summertime when, there's, when you have high humidity. We talked about tobacco smoke, other things we talked about like food, spicy foods, and then other things including medications. Um, aspirin, NSAIDs, we think about the classic uh, Santos triad uh, of, um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of polyps, uh, asthma, rhin and aspirin sensitivity. And also ACE inhibitors, we classically think about that as the ACE cough, but that could also cause rhinitis, as well as other medications, including uh, beta blockers. Allergic rhinitis classification, when you talk to allergists or when you talk to other folks, we classically think about them as, you know, uh, um, seasonal or allergic, uh, seasonal or perennial allergic rhinitis. In fact, when the phase three trials are typically done for approval of, a, say, a new antihistamine or a nasal steroid, that's typically what's in the FDA filings and so forth. But there's been a push over the past year, this is more of an international stuff, this is more of, I'm sorry, an international effort from the World Health Organization through, uh, um, through an initiative called ARIA, uh, Allergic Rhinitis and Asthma, where they kind of try to classify almost a little bit like asthma, where you can have intermittent versus persistent, and you have mild versus moderate, uh, uh, moderate severe. So you could have intermittent, ver intermittent moderate, uh, severe symptoms or intermittent mild symptom or persistent mild symptom, depending on the frequency of symptoms, you know, uh, more or less than four days per week, and whether you're having any type of disturbances in sleep, your daily activities, work in school, and the severity of the actual symptoms themselves. All right. Um, we also want to uh, find out how they did with previous medications, previous uh, experience with over-the-counter medications, including, uh, you know, uh, including the um, the adrenergic blockers like the oxymetazolones and so forth. Um, and we talked about comorbidities and then ATP as well too. The rule of thumb is that if you have one parent uh, with a, a history of atopic disease then the child has about a 25% chance of atopic disease. And if both parents have atopic disease, asthma, allergic rhinitis, allergic asthma, atopic dermatitis, then about 50% of the children will have some sort of atopic disease at some time in their life. Physical exam. Uh, you're looking at the, the nose, you're looking at the nasal septums, you want to find out whether the congestion is on one side, does it, uh, does it go from one side to the other, or is it always on the right side? So that tends to uh, argue for some sort of physical obstruction or a fixed physical obstruction. You look at the nasal turbinates, you know, it's, it, is it pale, is it bluish, um, is it boggy, uh, the mucosa red, and you know, is there any purulence to the nasal secretions? And then also you're looking for nasal pops, so you're looking for this glistening white type polypy tissue. Uh, on physical exam, you're looking, uh, you also palpate the sinus, uh, sinuses for tenderness. Some people try to do transillumination, but you know, that has you know, variable yield in terms of specificity, sensitivity. And then of course you're looking at the eyes and the ears, you're looking for again the, the, conjunctive, the concomitant conjunctivitis symptom that often happens with pollen allergies. And then as we mentioned a little bit earlier, a quick check of the lungs. All right, and then diagnostic testing, when we get to that, um, this is something that, uh, you know, if, uh, that you normally wouldn't do, but you would refer out for. Uh, if, you, if you're, if you're uh, definitely suspecting that there's issues with allergies and, you, and, uh, and they're not uh, responding to just your typical, you know, prescription medications. So we do percutaneous scratch tests and intradermal testing. So percutaneous is a kind of, uh, uh, is, uh, um, uh, has, uh, more specificity, intradermal testing has more sensitivity. But again, when you're, doing, when you're doing this type of testing, you still need to take it back to the clinical presentation. You still need to match up the uh, allergy skin test results with, um, the, um, with the clinical presentation. You can have present IgE, but that's not clinically relevant. 
Same thing goes for the in vitro IgE assays, you know, that we've, we uh, casually refer to as RAS. So, but UNICAP is probably the, the most common one that's used, that's typically used by uh, uh, research centers. There's other ones like you know, Immunolite. The, uh, the newest generation high core ra RAS um, generally, I think, also, you know, fit in this category. Some of the older RAS may not have the right um, sensitivity, sensitivity, or I'm sorry, the right predictive curve, so just be aware. So at least at UofL, you're, you're always safe if you use immunocap, thadia immunocap, okay? Skin testing, so here's an example of skin testing. So we mark, we mark, it, we mark uh, the, the, the spots on their arms or their back, uh, so the volar region of the forearm or the upper back, and uh, you place a drop of the allergen, you can, you can use a, any a number of devices it looks like a, you, know, you could do a, a smallpox needle or, or, or these tines that have tiny little force of the plastic ones. You do a simple scratch, you rock it, you're just breaking the surface of the skin, and then within 15 minutes you're looking for a wheel and flare reaction. And we usually document that either uh, with, by the actual you know, um, orthogonal... Um Whoa. Cool. Uh, I guess they're trying to reboot there. You're, you're, you're measuring the orthogonal the cross axis of the wheel and flare, and you're taking the average of the two. Um, or, uh, or in some cases, you're using a, one, uh, a plus grading system, one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus. Um, there's a move towards actually using more of the measurement because at least it's universally translatable. In terms of allergic rhinitis management, let me see how we're doing on time here because I want to make sure I keep time over Dr. Lee here. There are three major things that we, we look at uh, when we try to control allergic rhinitis. One is environmental control. Uh, two is medications, which are obviously you're very familiar with and you do all the time. And then number three, allergy immunotherapy when environmental control medications may be insufficient or not satisfactory. So let's talk about environmental control, all right? So again, it depends. And again, this is kind of where you, know, you would be able to do this if, uh, if you have specific uh, um, IgE results, either from skin testing or from uh, you know, in vitro uh, blood assays. So for things like mold allergies, you know, typical, uh, typical control, uh, uh, control measures, including keeping the place dry, using a dilute bleach solution to remove molds, cockroaches, obviously trying to get rid of the sources for cockroaches, like, like uh, covering, uh, uh, getting rid of open food, making sure there aren't areas where they can get in. Uh, using uh, insecticides and pest control where necessary. Pollen remaining indoor uh, during peak pollen uh, times. And we can get the information from the National Allergy Bureau, from the American Academy of Asthma, Allergy, and Immunology, or pollen.com, or some of these other websites. Uh, using air conditioning where possible. And if you're doing yard work or so forth, that if you're done for the day, you should take a shower so that you're not you know, shedding the pollen inside the house. For pets, ideally, you have to get them out of the bedroom even better from the entire house if possible, and uh, vacuuming where they are uh, to remove the uh, pet dander, and washing the pets regularly. That can, of course, you know, either getting, you know, the advice uh, for that type of stuff can get very volatile for both the patients and the pets, and you know, you want to get rid of the cat, you might get a reaction like this. <laughs> All right, moving on. So dust mite allergy avoidance is another thing that we do as well too. And by the way, the evidence for this is kind of mixed. So I'm not, you know, you, can, you see a lot of stuff, you see a lot of measures here, but if you look at the actual literature and you look at the strength of the evidence, I would have to say that some of this is mixed, but, you know, uh, um, but, it's, uh, but generally these things are low cost, low risk intervention. So it's something that we still feel that is worthwhile trying for, especially for patients that are suffering. So for dust mites, um, you want to keep the room dry, generally less than 50% uh, relative humidity in the summertime. High humidity allows the dust mites to, uh, oops, to uh, grow. Let me see if I can back up here. All right, great. And um, you want to wash the bedding regularly because that's where you're going to find them. They're going to be your bedding. They're going to be your carpeting. They're going to be your draperies. So you wash the bedding in hot water once a week to kill the dust mites. You use allergy-proof encasements. Uh, you know, you, uh, the fabric ones are more comfortable than obviously than the vinyl ones. The vinyl ones feels like sleeping on a garbage bag. So I usually try to steer away the patients from that. Uh, vacuum cleaning with a HEPA filter and a HEPA filter in a central furnace as well too. Uh, so whenever the, uh, whenever the, uh, the, the particles are disturbed, they will get picked up. 
removing carpet and, and pets and so forth if possible and infeasible in the environment. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. The, in terms of the management, this goes back to the uh, you know, classification that I shared with you a little bit earlier, so the RER guidelines. You know, again, this came out of the World Health Organization in 2001, was revised in 2008. Um, and as you can see, you know, uh, there is a bit of a stepwise uh, treatment uh, you know, set of recommendations, uh, similar to what you might see in the management of asthma as well, too. So these are, these are all familiar players to you, like nasal steroids, antihistamines, nasal decongestions or oral decongestions, uh, LTRA antagonists, uh, allergy avoidance and immunotherapy, you know, when symptoms become more se uh, severe or medical management and avoidance is not working. This chart simply outlines you know, the full array of things that you can throw at this, so the full armamentarium, and I realize that we don't have time to go through this, but I understand that this talk is being recorded, so you can take a look at this later. So, and so uh, this chart simply outlines you know, what type of symptoms that they can uh, control, onset of action and duration, so for our first line stuff, we typically think about nasal steroids, oral antihistamines, and this is their duration. But there are other things like oral decongestion, nasal epitropia for rhinorrhea, uh, mescopolamine for post-nasal drainage, nasal chromines, capsaicins, we'll talk about in just a little bit. So there's a whole series of things out there that you can use in addition to the traditional stuff that, uh, you're, that you know has been tried and true. So nasal steroids, you know, we know this to be effective uh, and all guidelines use this as the first line of therapy for any type of persistent uh, allergic and even non-allergic rhinitis. It works by three very different mechanisms to reduce total nasal symptom scores. So it reduces uh, um, mucosal inflammation. Uh, so that slows down that late phase reaction that we talked about a little bit earlier. It reduces the mast cells so that the next time that there is exposure to acute allergens, you have less, you know, you have less, you know, uh, uh, release of histamines, leukotrienes, prostacyclin, prostaglandins, etc. And then also you uh, you reduce basal dilatation, vascular leak, uh, and you uh, you uh, reduce glandular hypertrophy in the nasal passage. In terms of onset of action, you know, most people will quote you that you're going to get, you know. Uh, main effects probably within 12 hours, but you can see some effects uh, in a couple of hours, you know, once it gets in, you know, once it gets in there and binds the blue core uh, receptor. Uh, this slide just basically show you that for the most part, nasal steroids are fairly equivalent. Uh, so this is data comparing uh, uh, fluticosyl propropionate, uh, you know, which is very commonly used, as well as mometasone. All right, and you can see that, uh, uh, that they have pretty similar uh, uh, improvement in total nasal symptom scores you know, over a long period of time. And that can be sustained. So question for you guys. 30-year-old pregnant woman with allergic rhinitis needs a nasal spray. What would you recommend? So I am going to start, and I want to see what you guys think. So I've got about six folks. Let's see if we can get you guys up to 10. I know there's more than 10 people in here. Take a gander. Come on. OK. Oh, all right, good. All right, so <laughs> uh, there's something called, uh, I, I didn't talk about this earlier, but uh, there's something called uh, uh, absenteeism, which is you're not there. That's part of that whole work production. And then there's something called presenteeism, which is you're there, but you're not really there. So I suspect we may have a little presenteeism in here in the room right now. So anyway, I see that um, the majority of you folks have gone with fluticasone propionate, you know. By the way, not to be confused with fluticasone furoate, which undergoes by the goes by Veramis, that fluticasone propionate is, you know, the tried and true uh, um, uh, flonase. Uh, so the answer actually is A, budesonide is class B in terms of uh, pregnancy safety. So. Uh, and by the way, same thing when we talk about, you know, asthma medications, you know, in terms of an uh, uh, asthma controller, budesonide, pomocort uh, is class B. Uh, all the other uh, nasal steroids are class C. That being said, 
you know, I, I would not fault you for using fluticasone. It's been out there forever. Uh, if a patient comes to me and says, I love my fluticasone, I'm I, I wouldn't, and, and they don't want to switch, I would not fight them uh, because uh, the, 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 actual, the, the, the chances of anything happening are, are pretty low. All right, so I'm going to hide this and move on. All right, let's talk about antihistamines. So a good antihistamine should you know, mostly work on these types of symptoms, sneezing, rhinorrhea, itchy nose, itchy watery eyes, and maybe to some extent congestion, but that's where you're going to be mostly depending on your nasal decongestion, your nasal steroids. Uh, this happened to be a study with uh, a levo cetirizine. Now, just like nasal steroids, for the most part, the newer second generation, third generation antihistamines, we're talking about fexofenadine, cetirizine, levo cetirizine, desloratadine, those tend to be fairly equivalent in terms of total nasal symptom scores, you know, versus placebo. So, you know, you know, uh, again, you know, my own personal bias is I love, I love generic cetirizine. I send all my patients to Sam's Club and get the 15, uh, the one year supply for 17 bucks. I do it all the time. Uh, you know, before I consider say uh, something that might be a little more out of pocket for them, especially in this uh, this uh, day and age. Um, nasal uh, antihistamines. We hear about you know uh, um, nasal astelin, uh, 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 olopatadine, and so forth. And how do they compare? It turns out that nasal steroids still are going to be superior in terms of total nasal symptom scores. This was a uh, meta-analysis that was published several years ago, and uh, it looked at the, at these standardized mean differences. So they standardized these these uh, um, studies that were going head to head between a uh, nasal steroid and a nasal antihistamine. Anything to the left of this vertical line favors nasal steroids. As you can see, most of the studies trend that way or, or completely cross in terms of the confidence interval. And then when you get the, 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 the summative score, the, the, uh, the, the confidence interval is to the left of, uh, of, of zero. That being said, there is a, a growing evidence that adding for your patients who have severe allergic rhinitis with severe congestion, that adding a nasal antihistamine is more effective uh, than you know the the two you know agents by themselves. And so this was a study published. This, there's several studies, but this was published uh, three years ago. And uh, you can see that uh, unfortunately we don't have a placebo arm, which they should have had. But they have fluticasone by itself. You have azelastine by itself. And then they added the two together, and you can see the, the, uh, the change that was better, that was uh, significantly better than either azelastine or fluticasone. So we sometimes do this. So a typical regimen may be two sprays of fluticasone in the AM, each nostril, and then two sprays of azelastine in the evening. Uh, azelastine can be dosed at either BID or QD, especially with the, uh, with the, the, the newer, uh, the, the newer azelastine uh, preparation. We, call, we sometimes call this asteroid, so that's kind of keep it in mind. All right, finally, something about capsaicin. So this is the stuff that's in, you know, peppers and stuff like that. And Leonard Bernstein, you know, uh, Jerry's boss at Cincinnati, recently did a study that was just published and turning some heads, or at least turning some noses here, ha ha. Um, yeah, where, uh, where they found that uh, um, intranasal capsaicin and nasal spray can improve uh, total nasal symptom scores, especially in the nas areas of nasal congestion, sinus pressure, and sinus pain versus placebo. Uh, this has been around for a while. It works by binding to something called the uh, TRP valinoid 1 ion channel, or basically the capsaicin receptor, so that's easier to remember. And it works on the parasympathetic system, so it works on the afferent sensory nerves to basically desensitize it. Uh, and therefore, you know, knock down your non-allergic rhinitis, so what we sometimes call vasomotor rhinitis, okay? So that's something that you might be aware of. And it's, this particular product is marketed as something called Sinus Buster. Is it, is it available around here? Over the counter. Over the counter. It, is it in, in Kentucky? I've, I've not actually used it I yet, but... I've been in the pharmacy a while, but I bet it would be... Okay. I mean, I know it's in Cincinnati. Okay. Okay, great. So I've got about 15 minutes for rhinal sinusitis. I want to kind of keep us on track here. And so, um, uh, so Jerry Lee can do his talk here. So we talk about acute sinusitis. I like to, we like to, I like to call it rhinal sinusitis because technically, if you're going to have sinusitis, you're going to have rhinitis symptoms involved. 
And so generally that's the term that we tend to favor a little bit. You know, this basically just tells you that there's a lot of acute sinusitis, and so you already knew that. So in terms of the underlying causes, you're probably aware of many of these underlying causes. We've already talked about uh, uh, atopy as a major cause of acute uh, rhinal sinusitis, also infection, structural issues like uh, a, a deviated nasal symptom, septum, uh, hypertrophic turbinates, and then other issues as well to underlying diseases, cystic fibrosis, uh, Schirk-Strauss, Wegener's, you know, some of the stuff that'll show up on your internal medicine boards. Um, and then things like rhinitis medicamentosa when they're trying to you know, deal with their own allergic rhinitis or non-allergic rhinitis as the case may be. Sinus anatomy, you're probably again familiar with this when you go down the x-ray, but again, it's worth uh, reviewing uh, for those of you guys if, you're, if you haven't spent a lot of time looking at sinus film. Anterior to posterior in the coronal view, you tend to see, you'll see more of the frontal sinus up front. As you get towards the middle, you'll see the maxillary sinus. This is the uh, ethmoid bulla. This, and then you're seeing this is a, a frontal uh, sinus recess that would go anteriorly. Uh, and by the way, this is the right side of the face and this is the left side of the face when you're seeing it looking at a traditional uh, sinus CT scan. You've got your inferior terminates, your medial terminates, your middle meatus right here. And this right here is the all-important osteomedial complex that the radiologist often uh, talks about. This is where you have the ostea for the maxillary sinus um, in, in the middle meatus. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and it also, like I said, it, uh, also flows into the frontal sinus as well, too. If you go further back, you're going to go from the ethmoid sinus, you're going to start picking up the smesmoid sinus more posterior in the face, and then this is an axial view where you can get that top-down view. And again, this is an example where somebody who has basically pan sinusitis, and you can see that their osteomedial complex is completely stuffed up. You know, middle terminate, the uh, ethmoid bulla right there, uh, inferior turbine and so forth. And when you have recurrent infection, you reduce your ventilation, you, revision, you reduce your drainage of the sinuses, you get chronic inflammation remodeling that can eventually lead to chronic rhinal sinusitis. Uh, and in terms of you know, how, uh, the, the basic pathophysiology, these, ten, these are almost commonly triggered by a common cold or a viral paramyxal virus, an influenza virus. Uh, then you, so you typically have start with some symptoms, the patient starts to get better, but then acutely or all of a sudden starts to get worse because then they have bacterial superinfection with the, t with the usual suspects that you all know about, uh, and then you'll have increasing symptoms. And if, they, if it doesn't go away after 10 days, then your, your suspicion is very high for bacterial sinusitis versus, say, a, a viral rhinal sinusitis. If it goes on or is repetitive uh, beyond 12 weeks, then you're going to be looking at chronic rhinal sinusitis where you have a more of an issue with chronic inflammation, remodeling, a, um, uh, a T1 type, uh, um, TH1 type reaction, where you're having more uh, interferon gamma alpha, TGF beta, you know, and, and so forth. So we said that viruses are often a cause of acute sinusitis, but how much? So you know, I I I, I want to know what you guys think. So um, click in, click in. Do you think it's 20 percent? 40%, 60%, or 80%. So let's see, uh, let's see what you guys say. I'll leave it open for a couple more seconds here. Okay, great. So we've got 10, 12 people. All right, so I'm going to stop this. Stop that. Display the results. And you guys are saying, yeah, I'm thinking 60%. Very close. The answer is actually 80%. So the vast majority of all cases of acute rhinal sinusitis is virus-driven. So <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Good catch. All right. All right. You guys, you, uh, I, I got you guys credit. Very good. You guys did very good. So 80%. So the vast majority is rhinal, uh, is, is caused by viruses. All right. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, should I put on an E answer this morning? I was like, well, I didn't want to like give away. It's like 100%. I was like, well, that would sound, that would sound crazy. All right, all right, so, all right, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the microbiology, and again, you're all familiar, strep pneumonia, H. flu, Moraxella, Cataralis are the big ones. If you're looking at, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're looking at a chronic rhinal sinus, sinus picture, you're tending to think more of the aero, you know, like the anaerobes, some, uh, some of the gram negatives, uh, fungi, which tends to be, it can, it can be acute, uh, but it tends to be more of a uh, chronic type uh, issue. All right, 
About 15 years ago, there was a major rhinal sinusitis task force that was organized to try to help define sinusitis. And so they came up with uh, a categorization of major symptoms. Some use it, some don't. Of major symptoms and minor symptoms, you see the list here. And so, you know, so, so to meet the definition for sinusitis, you have to have either two major sy symptoms or one major symptom and two minor symptoms. Just keep this in mind. But you're going to be, again, asking for all the symptoms in general when you try to put together your picture. Sinus imaging, typically uh, in, in our ambulatory practice, for the most part, we're mostly only going to be using a CT for the most part. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it tends to be uh, more sensitive, and some say studies take more cost effective than your, 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 your usual sinus x-rays. Uh, but that being said, we generally don't do it until we're looking more at chronic sinusitis, and after we've tried, tried to treat them on an extended course of antibiotics, or if we're worried about certain issues like, uh, you know, severe eye pain, you know, uh, other issues, tooth pain, um, uh, um, uh, we're worried about uh, some sort of acute obstructions or so forth. MRI is something we think about when we when we when uh, we're chasing down possible fungal sinusitis, uh, you know, versus maybe a mass. All right, the the typical conventional treatment strategy includes. Uh, uh, you know, antibiotics, which we all think about, but we should also think about, you know, symptomatic treatment, including decongestants, pain medications, uh, same washing, uh, nasal irrigation, uh, topical or uh, systemic steroids, and then in recurrent cases or acute ongoing cases, possible, uh, you know, functional uh, endoscopic sinus surgery in patients who are appropriate candidates. And so an algorithm could be something like this, where, again, you know, because you're you're pretty much thinking four out of five times, it's probably going to be uh, viral. And if, you can, if you're in a position to watch and wait, you treat it symptomatically with uh, decongestants, uh, uh, um, uh, NSAIDs, uh, Tylenol, uh, topical steroids. And, uh, and if but they're not improving, then you would consider an antibiotic. But if they have primary signs of bacterial infection, uh, such as some of those major symptoms or symptoms are not getting better, or you're getting unilateral sinus tenderness, tooth or facial pain, a fever, periodontal swelling, then you automatically have to go to antibiotics plus maybe other studies as well too. If unsuccessful, then you can think about you know, surgical evaluation or, uh, and a differential evaluation, i.e., is this, am I really dealing with you know, run-of-the-mill chronic sinusitis uh, or am I dealing with, with other things? And we'll talk about that. These are typical antibiotic classes that you're all well familiar with. And generally, you're going to be reaching for uh, something that will give you good coverage for the uh, H-flu, uh, strep pneumonia, and moxera. So that could be uh, amoxicillin plus minus clavulanic acid. If you are still worried about uh, um, B-lactam resistance, you can obviously do high, high dose of amoxicillin before you go to some of the other, uh, other drugs or you go to the, uh, to the uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid or a second generation uh, cephalosporin. Uh, and then obviously there are other uh, choices including clinazone and then possibly adding on metronidazole or clindamycin if you're concerned about uh, uh, anaerobes and some gram negatives. Now again, if this is not, if, you're, if, you're, if they are not responding to treatment, then you're, you're, you're obligated to think about other things as well too. And, Things that often pop up in differential, and again, depending on the patient, depending on the circumstances and so forth, we tend to think about things like serial dysfunction, cartagoners, CF, you know, maybe some of the autoimmune Wegeners, uh, you know, some you know, uh, immune defects. So you know, Jerry will talk about that. Um, perhaps there's something going wrong with the medication, so NSAIDs, aspirin. Uh, so some, these are some of the other things that you might want to keep in mind. Fungal sinusitis. They've got um, really string, stringy, yucky, yellowish, uh, snotty cast coming out. Um, and then I'm going to wrap it up here a little bit uh, with typical, the typical approach for chronic rhinocytosis, which, again, you tend to be very uh, familiar with. Um, I do favor using nasal decongestion for short bursts, anywhere from three to seven days. Again, we want to avoid rhinitis medicamentosa. We want hydration. We talk, always talk about considering a long course of antibiotics. But remember, it's very controversial. There's not... Um, it is controversial whether uh, um, uh, infectious causes are truly the primary etiology driving chronic rhinocytis. We talked again about this chronic inflammatory process that's more of a Th1 uh, uh, neutrophilic uh, driven you know, interfering gamma type uh, process. And so antibiotics isn't really going to address that. Um, 
And then, of course, nasal irrigation and topical steroids are going to be your typical regimen. So when things get complicated or severe, you often will think about uh, referrals. And so generally, people that you will refer to would be us or the otolaryngologist. Us, if you are suspecting uh, atopic disease especially, um, and uh, if they have concomitant asthma in some cases, so environment, so, so therefore an environmental and uh, uh, allergen uh, evaluation uh, may be appropriate. Uh, if you see something uh, you know, on the CT that might be remedied by a procedure, then an olaryngology you know, uh, uh, referral would be uh, appropriate as well too. And then there may be other folks that you get pulled in, depending on what you're thinking and what you're pulling in. Uh, just a quick word about who we are. Uh, we are a uh, joint clinic that's supported by both the Department of Pediatrics and Medicine. You know, uh, we hope, uh, I hold positions in, in both departments, and uh, so will Jerry once all the paperwork is done. We have clinics every day except for Tuesdays. I know a number of residents actually rotate through. We're all on the 10th floor of the Gray Street building, and if you have a referral or something we can help you with, we'd love to be able to help you out. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jerry. Thank you very much for your time.